Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Binding Techniques webinar. We're so excited to have you tuning in with us today. Just a few quick announcements. You can go ahead and submit any questions that you might have in the questions pane, which is on the right side of your screen. We'll get those answered at the end of the webinar here. Also note that this webinar is being recorded for you and you will receive a link to that tomorrow. I would now like to introduce our presenter for today, Bernina Educator Nina McVeigh. Thank you, Megan. Welcome everyone. As Megan said, my name is Nina McVeigh and I am an educator with Bernina of America. Um, and I would just like to welcome you to our binding webinar. The Webster Dictionary defines binding as a narrow fabric used to finish raw edges. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. It does not define binding as an action that causes fear, um, as for some of you it might. For me, it's an action that causes great excitement because it means my quilt is almost finished. So today we will learn some basic techniques with tips and tricks to perfect your binding. We will discover decorative stitched binding and explore the binder attachment. As we get ready um, to do binding, we want to look at a few things. Do I cut straight or bias binding? Well, that really is your decision. There's not a right or a wrong. However, if you are doing a quilt with scalloped edges, of course, it is always going to be bias. Your fabric might dictate whether it's straight or bias. If I'm cutting a plaid or a stripe for my binding, I do want that on, on bias. And then, of course, the other consideration is how will it wear? How wide do you cut it? Again, your decision. How wide do you want the finished binding to be? Most quilters will start with a two and a half inch binding strip. However, if you are binding a quilt with pieced blocks right out to the edge, then you have to take a quarter inch seam allowance. And so your binding's going to be a little bit narrower, probably two to two and an eighth inches wide. And then how much do I need? Well, you're going to add all four sides of your quilt together and add um, generously 24 inches. You probably could get by with a little less, but that just depends um, on you. If I had a baby quilt and I was going to add all the sides together, I would have 45 plus 45 plus 60 plus 60 plus whatever you want to leave for manipulation. And I have put in 24 inches, so that's going to equal 234 inches. I will then divide that by the width of my fabric being 42 inches, and that's going to equal five and a half strips. So I'm going to round that up to six strips, multiply that by the width of the strip. So I need 15 inches of fabric to bind my baby quilt. And then the last question I have here is how do I join the ends? And we are going to talk about that a little bit later in the webinar. Before we get started, I do have a question for you. So Megan, if you want to launch our survey question, that would be great. All right, Nana. Well, it's, it looks like you had 64% say true that they almost always cut their binding on the straight of grain and 36% say false. Okay, thank you, Megan. That, um, that sounds about right. Uh, so when we start looking at cutting the binding, I've already said you can do it uh, straight of grain or bias, but let's take a little bit closer look at that. Um, straight of grain, there are actually two directions that would be considered straight of grain, the lengthwise grain, which runs parallel to the salvage edge. 
This is um, a cut that I would rarely use. There's absolutely no stretch to straight of grain. Um, I would only use this if I needed to because of my fabric. Cross grain is, uh, runs from salvage to salvage, and that has a little bit of stretch, which is uh, nice to have when we're working with our binding. And then of course, there's bias, which runs at a 45 degree angle uh, through the fabric. And this is going to have the greatest amount of stretch. The one thing uh, that you might want to consider when you're cutting your binding is how it's going to wear. Uh, straight cut binding will wear along one thread on the fold. So if it's been cut very straight and folded straight, you have one thread where it will wear. Bias cut binding will wear along many threads on the fold. So bias does wear a little bit better, but it will depend on the final use for your quilt. Let's look at cutting. Uh, I don't know how many of you avoid bias binding because of the cutting. It really is not difficult. If I lay my fabric out on my cutting board and I put the salvage edge to the right, then all I need to do is take that upper right corner of my fabric and fold it down so that the salvage edge is even with the cut edge on the bottom. I've literally folded a great big triangle and that fold is my bias, but it is usually too long at this point to cut with my ruler um, accurately. So I'm going to fold that big triangle in half pull up the bottom right corner up to the top and you will see I've got those two folded edges together and I have one solid fold on the bottom edge of my fabric. I will now take my ruler and line up a straight line on that um, one folded side and then I can trim off those two folded edges and I'm ready to cut my bias strips. Because I'm right-handed, this is orientated wrong for me to cut my strips. So the best way to get this turned is literally turn the whole board. If you have to move the fabric, just make sure that you're getting it lined up again, but it's best just to turn the fabric. I have cut, made one two and a half inch cut. And the bonus of folding your fabric this way is I get two strips with one cut. And the other bonus is if you look at the ends of my strips, they are already cut at a 45 degree angle. So when I go to seam them together, and I like to do a mitered seam in my binding, they are all ready to go. If I'm going to cut straight of grain binding, again, I'm going to cut it cross grain, which means salvage to salvage lay out my fabric, square it up, and then cut my strips. Once I've cut the strips and I seam them together, I have my square ends. So I'm going to overlap them like a picture frame and draw a line from that top V to the bottom V. You're drawing a 45 degree line. Now I don't always draw that line because you have such great markings on the slide on table on your Bernina machines. Um, I think in that lower picture, you can almost see um, the lines there and you have a line that's even with the needle. So sometimes I will just eyeball this, although for accuracy, you may want to draw the line. Once you've drawn that line and stitched on it, you are then going to trim the seam to a quarter of an inch. Press the seam open and then press your binding in half lengthwise. Now, uh, I'm ready to put the binding on, but I need to look at the quilt for a minute. Is it quilted all the way to the edge? If it is not, or if it's quilted but loosely quilted, you may want to secure the edges before attaching the binding. This will just make the process go more smoothly. One way to do that is to use an overlocker and I have just used a narrow three thread stitch to secure my edges and uh, neaten everything up. Now it's time to attach the binding. 
this is a step that I don't hear too many people talking about, and it's an important step. Before you go to the final um, step of attaching the binding, you definitely want to do a little trial and error and determine the correct seam allowance for your binding and your and your quilt. And this will vary with each quilt. Our variables are the fabric, the batting, um, how, how dense is the quilt quilted. So I do this with every quilt I quilt, even if I'm cutting the same width binding. I will start with what I assume is about the right seam allowance, but maybe a little, a little less. I will lengthen out my straight stitch. So if I have to take stitching out, it's easy to remove. I'm going to stitch about five inches. And here I've chosen a quarter inch seam allowance, stitched out about five inches. And then I wrap the binding around the quilt. And you'll see in this middle picture that a quarter inch seam allowance isn't enough because the binding is coming all the way around to the back of the quilt and it's way past my stitching line. And what I really want is that folded edge to just touch my stitching line. So with a little bit of trial and error, I have determined that 3 8 of an inch is the perfect seam allowance for this particular binding and quilt. As I said, you want to do that with every quilt. You also might consider, while I really like using my dual feed patchwork foot for this technique or, or um, this method, I sometimes will use my number one dual feed foot because I can change my needle position. Sometimes tweaking your needle position will give you the perfect seam allowance. It is also a reason I might be using my walking foot instead of my dual feed patchwork foot. So again, I've determined that 3 8 of an inch is the correct seam allowance. Knowing that, as I approach the corner of my quilt, I'm going to measure up from the edge of my quilt 3 8 of an inch and place a mark. You will probably get to the point where you can eyeball this, but uh, I kind of like to still mark that uh, little dot. It's, it's so accurate to do that and only takes a second. I'm going to stitch all the way down to that mark that I have placed and stop with my needle down. I'm going to pivot my quilt 45 degrees and stitch from this mark out to the corner of my quilt. So I'm stitching a real tiny little 45 degree line in the corner. I'm now ready to turn that corner and fold my binding into a miter. So I'm going to turn my quilt. I'm going to take my binding strip and fold it to the back. The little seam line that you stitch, that little 45 degree seam from the, from the um, seam line out to the corner actually helps fold this accurately. What I want to happen is the raw edge of my quilt to be even and form a straight line with the raw edge of my binding. I'm then going to fold that binding back down, bringing it towards you, making sure that the raw edge of my binding and the raw edge of my quilt are even, and the fold of the binding is even with the raw edge of the quilt at the top. Make sure that you don't um, have that fold just over the edge of your quilt because it will, will cause problems when you try and uh, fold the binding to the back. You won't get as neat of a miter. From this point, you're going to put your quilt back under the foot and continue to stitch your binding. And you're going to do that for all four corners. As you come back around, you'll see where you started. So you're going to stop about 12 or 14 inches from where you started. You're going to walk that binding up along the edges of the quilt. Uh, you're going to walk it from both sides. You, you want it to meet in the middle. You can pin it if you like, just to, to keep things in place. As you bring those edges together, you are going to just pinch 
the binding together where it's going to meet. Take a pair of scissors and put a little clip in the binding on the, un on the underside. So you've got a little clip as you see in that last picture. Hold that little clip together, hold both edges of the binding together. You're going to pivot the binding to form a square corner. So you're going to make sure the folds in the center of the binding are perpendicular to each other. The two little notches meet on the one side, and then you can draw a line from those notches to the lower V of the binding. And this is your stitching line. So go ahead and stitch on that line, trim off the ends, press in, finger press in a quarter inch seam allowance, or finger press your seam open, and then finish, go ahead and finish stitching your binding on. And that's how you join the ends of the binding. It's, um, I like to leave plenty of fabric, and that's why I said 24 inches. Some of you might not need that much, but I like to be able to manipulate that fabric um, and get a nice, neat seam. Once you've done that, it's now time to fold that binding to the back. So you're going to turn it to the back and secure it either with pins or binding clips. In the corners, you're going to, uh, the you're going to actually fold the miter on the back. On the front side, the miter just sort of happens. On the back side, you're going to fold one side in and secure it. And then you'll see that that is actually formed a 45 degree angle for the other, the adjacent piece of binding. You're going to fold that down and just fold in that miter and again, secure it with pins or binding clips. And it looks great. If we look at the front side, we see that whether you're on the front or the back, the mitered corner looks really, really nice. Now, some people will go back in when the quilt, when the binding is all secured and actually hand stitch that binding closed. That's something you might do if you were doing a show quilt, but um, I normally don't do that. Now, the big question is, how do I secure it on the back? Now what? I've machine stitched it on, now what? Well, I'm one of those people that I don't really mind the hand stitching uh, like we would do traditional binding. However, I'm sure there are many of you who would prefer to do machine stitching to secure your binding. If I look at my binding here and I'm thinking I could stitch in the ditch and catch it on the back side, mm, I might be able to. Uh, I can put on my number 10 edge stitch foot, and this is the dual feed edge stitch foot, and I can put that guide in the ditch of the seam, but I, if I'm doing a straight stitch in the ditch, I find it very difficult either to catch the binding on the backside, or if I have um, calculated it so that I'm going to catch the binding, it never seems to be quite straight. It doesn't seem to be perfect enough. So you might consider doing a stitch that has a little, what I would call a little bite to it, like doing the um, blind stitch applique stitch or the blind hem stitch. You'll see it here where you're just taking a little bite into the binding itself. And I have made this bite just a little bit wider than I normally would if I were doing it this way. And if you narrow that up even a little bit more, you really can barely see it. And if you do it, I purposely did it with contrast thread so you can see on the back where that stitch lies. Um, it doesn't look bad at all, uh, but I think that that can be perfected. And that's where decorative stitch binding comes in because the technique is really very, very similar. So here is my decorative binding. And the nice part of this is this looks exactly the same on the front as it does on the back. When I cut my bindings for decorative stitch bindings, I may cut them a little bit wider because I like to use the nine millimeter stitch. So I might cut my bindings two and three quarters to three inches wide. I'm using the walking foot here because again, I want to get that perfect seam allowance and I 
needed to move my needle position. So it just uh, was easier to use my walking foot where I have that ability. The key to this binding at least I, I feel the key to it, is when you turn it around to the back side, you're going to press it and you are going to use a fusible underneath the binding. So what you're actually doing is fusing your binding in place, fusing that folded line of, on your binding to the stitching line on the back. So you know exactly where it is and it's not going to move. I can then go to my machine, and I have so many beautiful stitches on my machine that I can choose one to stitch on the binding. I like to use a stitch, a decorative stitch that has a straight edge. So there are five stitches here. There are more if you look through your machine that you could probably find to use, but all of these stitches have what I would consider a, a straight side that straight side of the stitch is going to fall into the uh, ditch of the binding. Please remember that as you look at your stitches, you have mirror image, so that increases the number of stitches you can use if you can just mirror image them. There are times when you might need to tweak a stitch by changing the needle position, so you have control of that, and then Depending on the width of your binding, you may not always want to use a nine millimeter stitch and you have control of that. You can certainly change that. So I have chosen stitch number 735 and I'm always going to start my decorative stitching in the corner of my binding. I'm going to lower my needle right into that corner. Even though I'm using a nine millimeter stitch, I might not be using a nine millimeter stitch sometime. So it's a good habit to move your needle into a far left needle position and then lower the number 20 foot, whether it's the 20, the 20 C for the nine millimeter machines or the 20 D for your dual feed machines. You want to move your needle position to the far left lower the needle into the ditch, and that's going to be the beginning of your decorative stitch. You're going to go ahead and stitch the stitch so that it falls onto the binding, and when it swings over to the, to the left, it will fall off the binding. Stitch along one side. As you approach the corner, there are a few things you can do. You want this decorative stitch to end in the corner. So as you get close to that corner, you can use your pattern end function so that this will automatically stop at the end of your pattern. And if you're a couple stitches out, you can kind of watch that and gauge as to whether or not you need to fudge a little bit to get that needle to end in the next corner. You're going to turn the corner and even though you've just ended a stitch, just because you may have moved your needle a little bit, uh, I always like to use pattern begin so that I'm going to start again at this corner. Do that on all four sides of your quilts and you will end up with a beautifully stitched decorative binding. It looks good on the front, it looks good on the back. I really like stitch 725, that's another option for you. Um, and you may have looked at that stitch and thought, really, is that a flat sided stitch? But it does fall right into the ditch of the binding and looks really nice. A really common stitch to use for this might be a blanket stitch. Here I've used a very tiny blanket stitch in matching fabric, so it doesn't really show very much, but the technique is the same. So I could use a high contrast thread and a much larger, bolder blanket stitch for this. And then you might also consider a satin base stitch. The binding is certainly sturdy enough to support a satin stitch, and this looks very nice on the edge of a quilt or maybe the edge of a pillow or some uh, smaller project that needs binding. It looks good front and back. 
So that takes us to our uh, binder attachment. And um, as we look at this, there, there's a picture of a quilt there that has been bound with the binder attachment, binder attachment number 88, and the binder foot number 95 or 95C, depending on your machine. We have three binders in three different widths, and they are a quarter of an inch, three eighths of an inch, and half an inch. The picture you see here is a quarter inch binder. The three eighths also works nicely. The half inch for me is a little bit wide. I like to do scalloped edges and it just gets a little wide in the scallop. It would be a great binder for quilts, for utility quilts, for charity quilts, quilts where you might need a little bit more um, substantial binding. So as we consider the binder attachment, Meg and I have another survey question. Let's find out who's using their binder attachment. All right, Nina, it looks like 9% said true and 91% said false for that one. Okay, thank you, Megan. That's about what I thought. Um, doing your quilt with the, with the binder attachment, I will tell you, does take a little practice. Um, but once you practice, the rewards are so great. I love binding my quilts, especially a scalloped edge quilt with the, bias, with the binder. Um, I have... Um, a link in the handout and that will link you to um, Bernina International, the video on how to put the attachment onto your machine. You, there are instructions that come with the binder as well as the big book of feet or your dealer uh, can help you with that. Once we get that set up, we are going to look at binding your quilt. Again, I like to use, um, or I like scalloped edges. So I am going to use a ruler. I like the leaves galore rulers. They come in three sizes. The reason I like them is they have a gentle scallop on one side and a more aggressive scallop on the other side. As a beginner, you are definitely going to use the gentle scallop. I will always draw my scallop on my fabric. I can draw as many times as I need to. But if I started cutting my scallop, I can only cut once. So I don't want to make a mistake. So draw your pattern from the center out. And then sometimes I just need to fudge my corners to make them work. I'm going to attach the number 34 or 34C clear foot. And that has a nice red mark in the center of it. I'm going to take the line that I drew place my quilt underneath the foot so the line is on that center mark and I'm simply going to do a straight stitch on the drawn line. And then I'm going to trim my quilt very, very close to the stitching, so close that you might even cut the stitching once in a while, but that's how close I would trim it. I'm then going to take my quilt, put it back under the foot so that the cut edge is in the center of the foot and I'm going to do an off the edge zigzag. So that is just selecting the zigzag stitch, the default width. I'm going to lengthen it out a little bit. It gets a little heavy if you don't. So lengthen it to uh, 2.5, line up that cut edge in the center and let the zigzag stitch fall off the edge. But that gives you a nice off the edge zigzag and my quilt is now ready to bind. The edges have all been held securely together and it's even compressed it a little bit. So it's much easier to put into the binder. Set up the binder on your machine and then to load the binder. And remember I said there are three different sizes of binders. 
each binder comes with instructions on how wide to cut that binding. So you're going to swing out the binder attachment. You're going to slide your binding strip into the end of the binder. And there's a little opening there to help you move that binding through the attachment. And remember, it will work better if you have an angled end. As you move that binding strip through, you're going to pull it to the first part of the binder where the raw edges are turned in. Keep pulling it through, and it will go through the second part of the binder where the binding is folded in half. Bring it to the back, put it under the foot, and lower the foot to hold it in place. Now, before you start stitching, you're going to want to look at where your needle is and look at where the binding is. In this photo, if my needle were in center position, it would totally miss the binding. So you are going to want to move your needle position to the right to make sure that it is going to hit the binding. Stitch out a little bit so you can see where that needle position um, is and what that looks like on the binding itself. And you wanna make sure everything is flowing through the binder uh, nicely. Add your quilt by putting it into the V part of the, of the binder. So you'll just slide it in. Use a stiletto if you need to, to help uh, keep it in that portion of the binder. And then just start sewing. And, I, and it is like magic. It just goes through the binder. And when you're done, you will have a bound quilt. Done. You don't have to do anything else. It's done. And it looks so nice. So here's another picture where that binding looks very, very nice around that scalloped edge. And it looks not only from the front, but from the back, it looks just as nice. So there are a few tips and tricks I can share with you. Before you cut your binding strips, I would spray starch my fabric before cutting. Um, so you have some, um, some stability to that fabric. Your seams are an eighth of an inch, so I will take a quarter inch seam and then trim it down to an eighth of an inch and press my seam open. But as the seam goes through the binder, if it doesn't want to stay open, then I will use a little bit of glue, uh, like a glue stick to hold those seams open. And then I'm sure somebody is wondering, how do I end my binding um, when I get back around to the beginning? And that is also a very easy thing to do. So what I want to do is look where I have started my binding and I want to trim that off square to the fabric. I might even have to take out a couple stitches if I've kind of angled onto my fabric, but I want it trimmed square to the fabric. I'm going to stitch all the way around until I'm four and a half inches um, from that beginning point. The needle is four and a half inches from the beginning of the binding. I can take a tape measure from the needle along the edge of the binder and I'm going to cut my binding off at five inches. When you get used to this, you won't always have to use a tape measure. You will be able to, to tell how you, where you need to cut it. So cut off your binding and then fold in a quarter inch hem and you're going to glue that in place. And then you're just going to finish binding. That will go through the binder. Use your stiletto a little bit if you need to as you approach that, that end and you will go right over the beginning of the binding and it's going to look great. When you are new to the binder, you might consider using a zigzag stitch instead of a straight stitch. Uh, you know you will be catching both upper side and lower side, and you won't have to worry too much around the curves, but that's a great way to get started with the binder. Another idea for you is, after you have used the binder, is to go back, and this is just um, baby rickrack that I have placed over the binding and zigzag down. So if you have any places where you didn't quite catch it, this, of course, will take care of that. Once you've perfected the binder, another thought might be uh, for you to use the invisible applique stitch. And I have shortened the length and narrowed it quite a bit. So on this particular quilt, it just looks like a little hand-picked stitch on the front and on the back. So um, hopefully you will go back to your bindings and um, 
take with you any of the tips and tricks we shared. And I just want to remind you that these are only a few binding techniques. But good binding always comes back to accurate cutting and accurate seaming. So with that, Megan, do we have any questions? Yes, we did. We had some really good questions this time around. Um, I would encourage everyone to keep posting questions in the questions pane. And if we don't get to them, go ahead and email me and I'll pass those on to Nina. But let's go ahead and get started with what we have. When stitching the binding um, up to the corner, once you make that turn and have folded your fabric again, do you start at the edge of the quilt or do you start a quarter inch down? Or quarter inch I, down? I start at the edge of my quilt. Okay. Yeah. Um, a friend told uh, this viewer that she uses the 71 fit, foot for her binding. Can this be done using the Abs Absolutely, it's a, great, it's a great technique. It's a different technique. As I said, there are a lot of different techniques and um, I wish we had time for all of them, but that is a good technique. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, some, someone asked, they have a lot of bulk when they go around their corners. How do you reduce the bulk when you're going around your corners or is there, is there something you can do? For traditional binding, I, I'm assuming it's traditional binding and turning that corner. Um, I guess I, I don't have a lot of bulk there. It might, I mean, if you're, if your quilt is traditional cottons and your binding is a, is a traditional cotton fabric, um, if you, I don't know if the bulk is coming from the quilt or the binding. If it's coming from the quilt, I would make sure that the edges of my quilt, you might even at the corners uh, do an off the edge zigzag um, in that area just to keep everything together. And then um, if there's bulk in the binding, it, it might be how it's being folded. So I would take another look at that. Okay, sounds good. What's the benefit of using an overlocker stitch versus just straight stitching around the edge of your quilt? Um, you know, the overlocker is, is going to be a little wider. And it neatens all the edges and keeps all everything everything neat. I wouldn't say there's one as an advantage over the other. It's just a nice way to do it. Um, you could certainly do it with a zigzag stitch as well. Okay. The next question is, does using bias strips require more fabric than using the straight of grain? And if so, how do you calculate that? <laughs> um, it probably will use a little bit more. Uh, the calculation, of course, is a little bit more difficult. And because we've had that question, I did add a chart to my PowerPoint. Um, and this is from the website that you see here. And there is a mathematical formula, but it gets pretty, um, pretty mathematical. Um, as you can see, um, where you add the perimeter of your quilt and the width of your binding strips and you take the square root. And at that point, when people hear square root, they sort of just stop listening. Um, but there are charts out there for calculating your binding. And you can see from this chart that if we look at the middle column of 200 to 350 inches, um, that that's a good size quilt. And if you're cutting two and a half inch strips, um, seven eighths to, uh, to a yard will do a good size quilt. Okay. I, usually, I usually figure about a yard for a quilt, unless I'm doing a really big, um, like California King, then I'm gonna buy a yard and a quarter. Okay, very interesting. What are your thoughts on uh, first sewing the binding to the back of the quilt and then bringing it to the front. That's certainly an acceptable method as well. I think if you do it that way, then it really is going to depend on how you finish it on the front side. You certainly could do a decorative stitch binding that way. Um, I guess I like to do it from the front to the back because to me that the neatest part I want on the front. And to me, the neatest part is the seam the seamed edge of your binding. But I know many people who do it from the back to the front and that's perfectly fine. Yes, I was gonna say, I definitely agree. I like, I like going front to back just so you have that clean finished edge there. Mm -hmm. What about the number 87 binder attachment? Do you like that more than 
um, the 88, or is it just a matter of size? No, the 87 is another binder attachment that uses pre-folded bias or pre-folded binding. So if you buy packaged binding, that is the binder that you would want. Or if you use the uh, bias binder makers that you run a strip through it and then you press with your iron, you can make your own strips that way and run it through. But that's generally a single edge of fabric. So I don't think that kind of finish is as strong on a quilt as a double folded binding. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Can you use, I guess this is another good question relating to that, can you use a double fold bias with the binder attachment or no. just? No, no. And as I say that, I mean, you're right, even our 88 is a single fold, but um, I just like it better because because I like to cut my own fabric and I don't like packaged binding but but really totally that's that's um a choice and both binders work well sure and i think you might have said this at the beginning of your presentation but do you have a favorite width that you like to cut your binding at i like to do two and a quarter i would mm -hmm. say as i have talked to quilters most quilters um do two and a half but i would mm -hmm. say those two are probably the most popular cuts mm -hmm. awesome um let's see if i can find another good one. Oh, we did have someone ask and this is you know kind of project specific but they are using like pretty thick materials is there uh, an adjusted width that they need for accommodating extra thickness well there may be I, I mean i don't know how thick their fabric is but that's one of the considerations that's why you test your seam allowance because it's the thickness of the fabric that can affect that seam allowance um, so you might again i don't know how thick we're talking but you might consider cutting your binding wider mm -hmm. um, that's where i might do a little sample before i get to the to the final project gotcha and one last question here, just for clarification, can you explain the difference between the binder feet and the attachments or how they relate to each other? Uh, when I mentioned the binder attachment and the foot number, the binder foot number 95, mm -hmm. um, the binder foot is the foot that you need on your machine to use the binder attachment because when you put that binder attachment on the machine and you screw it to the bed of your machine, there are some adjustments. Those adjustments are based on having the number 95 or 95 C foot on your machine. Okay. And when using uh, the binder foot, can you use decorative stitches with that or is it just for straight stitches? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, when I said zigzag, I mean, that most people don't consider that a decorative stitch, but it's the same principle. I definitely have done the blanket stitch on the bias binding or the binding with the binder attachment. I say bias because I generally use bias through my binder, but you can use straight cut binding as well. Um, but yes, any decorative stitch, again, I would probably want a flat sided stitch, but I have also written with my letters from my machine, I've written happy birthday in the oh binder God. as well. So. Very cool. Yeah. All right, and one last question here. Can you do square corner quilts with the bias binder? <laughs> I was just thinking I had a few slides on that and I don't know what happened to them. Um, but yes, absolutely, you can turn a uh, corner, a square corner. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have those photos in my presentation. However, if you go to the Bernina International YouTube channel and you and you watch the video on the binders, it would be on binder 87 and 88. There's an excellent uh, tutorial in that video on turning square corners. All right. Well, I think we can end with that. Again, if you have any other questions, go ahead and email those to me and I will pass those on to Nina for you. So Nina, did you have any closing remarks? I don't, but I just want to thank everybody for coming and uh, listening to our webinar on binding. And I and I certainly hope that you gained um, at least eight 
a tip or a little trick that you can use. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nina. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Tomorrow you'll receive a follow-up email again from GoToWebinar with a link to this recording. In a couple of days, the webinar and handouts will be available on Bernina.com. To get to those, you click on Learn and Create at uh, the tab on the top right corner, then Classes, and then Webinars. If you have any other questions and or if we were not able to answer those today, go ahead and email me and I'll pass them along. Um, on behalf of Bernina, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Megan. Yes, thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.